Lord that I have spine surgery. Lord, you heal my body. Say, Lord, I hear you. I'm going to do what you say. Do what you say. Lord, I hear you. Lord, I hear you.
if you know it, come on and help us say it. Lord, I, I, I my my come on, everybody, let's sing it corporately. My help, my help.
can sit after that but praise God we thank God for his presence we thank Lord thank God for giving us strength for being the strength of our lives and I don't know about you but this week I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord it's been a it's been a rough week seems like every place I look around the devil is popping up but I look up and remind him that my father takes care of me hallelujah and I just let the devil know my God sees you and you're in trouble you're in trouble because he don't play about this one Kim Evette Murray Hill I don't know about y'all but God don't play about this one I have to let the devil know you need to back up because vengeance is his I don't have to do anything but cry out to my father and my God and he's on the scene amen Amen. So I am thankful to God for being here today, for being able to stand for you, to give him praise and honor and glory. But I'm also glad to be before you to, to honor our fathers on this morning. So I'm going to ask if all of the fathers would please stand. All of the fathers, please stand. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. 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 We honor all of you. We thank God for you because you are a blessing not only to the kingdom, but to our families. And we love you so much for all that you do, how you show up, the way you show up. We are thankful to you. And before I get into our, our poem that we have for our fathers on today, I want to acknowledge the oldest father in the house, the oldest father, the more seasoned father. Where, where, more seasoned, more, more. Okay, so if you're 70 and older, please stand up. 70, Pray, uh, we, we, we've already identified the oldest father. And listen, not only is the most seasoned, but he's the most radical just out the box just come out ready I don't think he has an off button I think he wake up on just on a thousand so we thank God for him amen 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 now what about our youngest father youngest father I'm gonna start off at 25 okay wait now listen I know my vision is a little short but claim it in Jesus' name. Claim it. Praise the Lord. I'm going to start at 25. 25. Praise the Lord. Anybody younger than 25? Amen. Let's salute our youngest father. Amen. On his journey. Hallelujah. Glory to God. We thank God for you. Now, what about the, the one that's, that's, that has a fertile mama and just giving out seed? 
the one, one, the one that has the most children. Most children. I'm not gonna call out nobody's name, but the most children. Deacon Joe, how, how many kids do you have? Seven. Anybody got more than seven children? Let's salute our father that has the most children. Hallelujah. Glory to God. What about our newest father? Newest father, the one that just, just maybe had a baby in, in the last year. Amen. Amen. How old is your child? Seven months. Anyone have a child younger than seven months? All right, he has it. We thank God for you. And he's a girl dad, so that's, that's a special honor. Amen. We salute all of you. And, and again, before I go into this poem, I want to salute, of course, we've already saluted our Heavenly Father, but I want to salute our spiritual father because he does such an awesome job fathering us. He covers us. He protects us, he prays for us, he labors before God on our behalf, and I know that you probably only see the Sunday morning and the Tuesday evening, but I get to see behind closed doors when he is truly laying before God on our behalf, when he's taking the phone calls late at night, um, when he's going out to visit and going out to minister to not only you, but people who are connected to you that are not connected to this church, but because of you, he ministered to, to those people. That's the kind of father we have. And so I want you to put your hands together and celebrate our spiritual father. We thank God for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So before I leave you, I want to leave you with these words. He is father. He is the shine in a little girl's eyes, the icon of a son in the mirror, a husband to his woman, a provider and a leader, the endearing traits of a real man personified in how he lives. He is the strength of the family unit, the shelter in a raging storm, a patriarch to the ancestral tree. His seed produces legacies to carry on his dynasty. He is stability in the midst of adversity. He rules with a gentle hand, teaches his daughter how to be loved, to accept nothing less than a true man. He instills pride in his son to be the best man that he can be. Once a year is not enough to give credit where it is due. He is a monumental influence to the innocence of youth, a consonant pillar of masculinity without a heavy hand as proof. If you had to measure a man in all he say or do, it is in the path he chooses to follow. It is the fruits of his wealthy spirit that makes him so unique. It is he, a father, the qualities of a hero unsung, 364 days of the year. On this special day, we salute you fathers. Happy Father's Day. Amen and amen. Well, Citadel Church, what time is it? Uh, I need that again. Citadel Church, what time is it? Amen. It is time to be blessed. It is time to give back to God just a portion of what he has blessed us with. We do have a quicker way of giving to the Lord. We have, uh, you can scan the, um, the code and uh, that is much quicker. Or you can do cash out. And that's dollar sign, the Citadel Jacks. Dollar sign, the Citadel Jacks. Or you can text the give. 
And if you text to give, that number is 844-671-1400. Amen. If you're ready, we, you also have the deacons down front with the receptacles you can give. And we're asking everyone to please stand. And we're asking everyone to please come down when it's time to please give. And if you're giving online, please just take your phone and tap on the receptacles. And it's just an honor of letting the Lord know, hey, I have given. We know he knows, but it's just to do it. Amen. And we have our attendance up front if you would like to give as well. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much for this opportunity. For your word says, give, and it shall be given unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto our bosom. We thank you, God, that you're asking only for a 10%. And as we give you 10%, give us the wisdom to maintain the 90%. And we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you praise. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen, amen, and amen. Please listen to the um, instructions of the ushers. Everyone face the walls. Well, bless the name of the Lord. 
I figured I'd tell the praise team go ahead and and uh, and have a seat because even though I was mildly embarrassed at the start because they their memories are not as good as mine obviously I am thankful to God for how well they recovered y'all had y'all y'all ended up having to work they a little harder this <laughs> Oh, bless his name. And, and, and I know y'all appreciate and love on them, singers and band, because they were, they were shocked. Because it was one of those, girl, you got to come by my house. You know, y'all ain't never did that. You Somebody, you know, in town, so you like, hey, stop by the house. That's exactly what happened. And so they, their normal preparation time, they didn't have. Uh, but they, they did. They recovered nicely. So everybody is still employed. Amen. Would you thank God for our music ministry, please? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I give God praise for them. It's an amazing group of people, really. And, and I'm thankful that they serve here. Amen. 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 To all of our guests, hey, we're glad that you're here. We pray your heart has been blessed already uh, and that as we go a little further uh, in the worship experience collectively, uh, you'll, you'll hear what God has for you. Amen? So I want to begin by saying uh, thank you to those who came specifically because I said last week, uh, if I'm your spiritual father, something to the effect, if I'm your spiritual father, I want you to, I want you to be here. There's some things I want you to hear, some things I want uh, you to experience in a rich way. And to be quite honest, the discernment of the moment that I spoke of last week, I, I, I actually commun that I communicated that ineffectively because it wasn't so much about those who see me as their spiritual father it was about my assuming that role fully today because I believe that there is a need for reclamation of sons and daughters and for sons and daughters to see and desire to come back home they need the consistent presence of the Father to be there already in place. I think we're going to see that in just a moment. And so I'm believing God that we as a church would prepare ourselves more than ever before we have prepared ourselves for sons and daughters that are coming back home. Home to the heart that connection that may have been lost. They are not coming back to church. There is a need for them to come back home. I'm not talking about the building. I'm not talking about the institution. I'm talking about the need for sons and daughters to come back home. That there is a need when they return for them to not be met, met with only rules. For them to not be met with only stipulations. But to be reclaimed and reconnected to the heart that has always longed for them. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? It would be trite of me to say we are way past business as usual or church as usual. Even when we do things that look familiar, the season we are in right now, there is such a great need for people to know home is available. Y'all hearing what I'm saying? Home is available. There, there's a text that I'm going to share. It's in Luke 15. Go ahead and find it if you would, please. Luke 15, I'm going to start at verse 1. 
And, and one of the things I want you to do in that is understand, I believe it quite apropos that we would celebrate Father's Day and Juneteenth on the same day this year. Uh, I think it I think it important that we understand that one of the things that enslavement did to our people was destroy the image of father among us. The black male was attacked and that not just physically. And in a lot of ways, we are still seeking freedom from a negative image of black men. That is not just the image that non-blacks have, but sometimes the image that blacks have of themselves. And so to have Father's Day and Juneteenth on the same day, I, I think that's quite apropos. So I do celebrate all of the men. And one of the things that I, I want to say to us in our celebration is the responsibility that's on us to father well. Yes. We've got to father well. Uh, I think in part fathering well means fathering authoritatively, meaning that you operate completely in your role and responsibility. Not, it's not the tone of your voice that denotes authority. It's not even the strength of your hand that denotes authority. Real authority happens at a heart level. And it first assumes the responsibility when the role has been granted. Because quite honestly, for, for Terry Hill Jr., I didn't become a father until I became a father. When Kim told me we're pregnant, I wasn't a father. But over the course of nine months of the baby developing, my mind started to shift. And it became a responsibility for me to sit firmly in that shift and be a father. I think also we have to father compassionately. And this is just my encouragement and, and I, don't, I won't be very long today, I promise. But, but we have to father compassionately and I believe that that is with respect to what every child needs. I know we like to think we love all of our children the same. And while we may love them with the same love, the way it's expressed is gonna be based upon the needs of each individual child. You know? And that's not just in our homes, but it's in our communities. You have to love, love certain communities in expression differently. Some of y'all didn't catch that. It's partly political. <laughs> but but you, gotta, you gotta have the same love but you got to express it differently based on the needs of the individual. I think that's what it means to father compassionately. And I also think we have to father resourcefully. Unsent, I think it means that we have to use everything at our disposal to father well. For me, it means not just using my skill, my wisdom, my experiences, it means using fully my mistakes. Because the mistakes I've made are tools that God has given to me to ensure others don't make them. Most of all, my children. So the persons who need to hear about my mistakes the most are the ones who are looking up to me. And so my prayer today fathers is that we father well. There's this amazingly familiar passage of scripture in Luke chapter 15. And 
I almost hesitated to go here because it's so familiar. And, you know, church folk, Elder Hudson, we, we do different things. I'm sorry, I'm trying to get it together. Hold on. All right, I need to give myself a little room for my movement. Um, because when you go to familiar Bible passages, people have a tendency to turn off, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the prodigal son, but I don't wanna talk about the prodigal son. I wanna talk about his daddy. Okay? And I'm gonna tell you right now, if you are <clears throat> one given to stoic religious thought, some of what I propose today may be a challenge, okay? Pray for me, all right? Pray for me. Don't immediately get offended, take it home. Think about it, pray about it, okay? In the book of Acts, the Bereans were those who, who went home and read, studied for themselves. They didn't just take everything that was said to them. Did I, did I mess it up when I moved it? Oh, you gonna get me? Okay. All right. Luke chapter 15. I'm gonna read verse one. Verses 1 and 2, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 20 and read through verse 24. I'm in the New Living Translation. And, and to all of those who were worshiping on uh, Facebook, we apologize that, that uh, Warner Music said we didn't have a right to play the songs that we were playing, but the lady, it was her songs. All right, anyway. I just wanted to share that. So they blocked us on, on Facebook for a minute. Uh, but YouTube and Roku were still good. All right, so if ever Facebook acts up, go check that first, okay? All right, Luke chapter 15, verse one. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. <laughs> this made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So, so he, they come to hear him teach often, but he doesn't stop in his relationship with them at teaching. He fellowships with them. Y'all hear that? And they are tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Verse 20 says, in the story of the prodigal son, so he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. Been preparing for something and didn't realize it. Didn't realize exactly what they were preparing it for. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now is found. So the party began. I think it interesting as you go back and look at verse one that we, we are reminded why we get this parable. It is the third of three stories that Jesus gives that talks about lostness, all right? He talks about lostness. He talks about a sheep that has been lost. He talks about a coin that has been lost. And then to further emphasize the point, he gives them a third illustration in quick succession, three stories because he wants to highlight the 
the concept of lostness. And he talks about this son, a sheep, a coin, a son, all to emphasize a point of lostness. But, but he emphasizes this point because the, 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 the religious folk and the teachers of the law didn't understand his association with tax collectors and other notorious sinners. Please don't miss this. The only reason we get the story of the prodigal son is because Jesus has to make a point about how you handle lost stuff. So the posture of the father in the story is the posture of Jesus to the individuals that verse 1 calls tax collectors and other notorious sinners. In other words, the posture of the father is the same as that of Jesus in his reasoning for even sharing the story while others are upset about who Jesus is spending time with. His understanding and regard for them is simply that they are lost. Yeah. They are not less. They're just lost. Okay. Yeah. Let me emphasize that just a little bit more. Everybody we think doesn't measure up. Right. Jesus says they're just lost. Yeah. They are not less. They are just lost. And what's interesting is more of us have the perspective of the religious folk than the perspective of Jesus. Because if I ask you about someone who's not in the church, we will give every adjective, every category of those individuals except lost. We'll give everything that exposes and expresses why they are less. And so we'll talk about the sins they are in. But we, we won't talk about them as an individual. We'll, 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 talk about, we'll talk about how much they lie and how much they steal and how much weed they smoke and, and how many sex partners they've had and whether or not they're, they're, they're gay or, 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 or whatever. We'll talk about all of that. Because the intention is to present the perspective that in some way, shape, or form, they are less. And so we categorize them just like the religious folk did. It was a whole bunch of notorious sinners. But what is Jesus' perspective? He's hanging with them. And they obviously know he's open to them because they come to him often. Whatever will happen to the church when hurt people stop coming to you? Help us to never be a church where broken people no longer want to come. Because here's Jesus being talked about because the people he chooses to spend his time with are the ones other folks says are notorious sinners. And Jesus says, no, they're just lost. Which means their value isn't diminished because they're lost. Their value isn't diminished because they're not in the house. Their value isn't diminished because I can't put my hand on you. You, you don't lose value because you stop coming to church. Amen. The value isn't even diminished because of what you left for. The point is that those who are coming to Jesus are in the eyes of Jesus just lost, but not less. And so regardless of what category others put them in or how others describe them, they are lost 
only and the father's heart towards them has never changed whatever is undesirable about you or to you still does not change the fact that you are the desire of God's heart and so if I was putting a tag on the text if my if I had a title this morning it would simply be a father's heart because because it's the reason that he continues to look for you because you've never lost value. And if we ever see people who are not in relationship with Jesus as anything more than just lost, we lose. Because it means we've got the wrong perspective. And the perspective needs to change. Didn't anticipate a whole lot of amens today. That's why I'm glad Lucinda worked y'all up. And baby work, so y'all pray, pray that uh, Bishop McLaughlin is not upset with me if she didn't make it to church on time, okay? I texted him and asked him, asked him could, could she come? He said, yeah. And now he might say no the next time, I don't know. It's a father's heart. Um, I think some persons need to know today Leaving the father's house does not mean you leave the father's love. I think it's unfortunately the assumption sometimes. I think we feel like because we may break his heart, we also break his love. But somebody, somebody's watching sitting on the couch, on the side of the bed, or on the eighth row on the left side, and you need to know, just because you left the Father's house, you have not left the Father's heart. You cannot, please hear me, there is nothing you can do that's going to stop the love of God. Nothing. And here, here's, here's, what, here's what has to be grasped fully. If anything could, then it's not worth what doesn't. Even when we read the text in Romans where it says he gave them up to a reprobate mind, that, that, that only speaks of how He relates to them. There are moments where you take your hands off. But it doesn't change your heart. Everybody hear what I'm saying? And I need us as as Christians to stop treating people like God stopped loving them. Buckle up. Do you know God loves the man that raped you? All right. Yes, sir. Do you know God loves gay, lesbian, transgender? You do know that, right? Like, he's not waiting on them to make some change before he resumes love. Do you know God loves liars? Somebody's like, (laughs) (laughs) There is absolutely nothing you can do because whatever it is that has pulled you away from the Father's house, it has not caused you to leave the Father's heart. He's got one category. For everybody who's not in the house, one descriptive. For everybody who's not in the house, you know what that descriptive is? Lost. That's it. And in the instances prior to the prodigal son, it's 
It's the assumption, not the assumption, it's what's presented. They have to be found, not find their own way. Which means there has to be, hallelujah, an intentional search. Go read the text. The shepherd doesn't sit back and talk about the sheep until he or she returns. He goes out to get them. The woman doesn't wait and hope for the coin to unlose itself. She sweeps the whole house looking for it. And even the father makes the, makes the presentation apparently every single day. I'm going to go stand in a place where I can see if he's coming because there is a responsibility of whoever is in the house to always be looking for what is lost. Yeah. No. The father's heart is greater than anything you could ever get into. Because you can't, you can't leave his love. You are never beyond his search or his reach or his ability to reclaim you. You are recoverable. I need somebody to hear me right now. You, you are recoverable. Like you, you didn't lose value. You didn't lose worth. You are still as important to God in the middle of whatever you got going on as you were on your best day, the day you felt the best about yourself. You are as valuable to God now as you were then. As a matter of fact, you're more of a responsibility. You're more of a privilege because he's looking for whoever is not in the house. Do y'all understand? L listen, listen, I, 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 my wedding ring, is valuable to read, valuable to me. It's valuable economically, it's valuable sentimentally, it, it is valuable to me. And understand something, if I lose this ring, I don't care what it falls in, the value of the ring doesn't change. If I drop it in dung, it's as valuable covered in doo-doo. So somebody said, what's dumb? <laughs> it's as valuable covered in trash as it is on my finger. Y'all ain't getting this like I need you to get it. It's the reason, hallelujah, for the search because the value is never lost. And so I don't care if you smell like the sin you were in last night. God says you're still valuable. I'm going to leave y'all alone. Maybe it's too simple. But it makes me happy to know that I'm renewable. I'm recyclable. Y'all ain't feeling that. Y'all ain't. <laughs> I'm, I'm recyclable. I remember <laughs> my, grand, my granddaddy, my granddaddy, my granddaddy Pop, Willie James Thomas went through this phase. He was, he was uh, uh, collecting cans. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember the can collecting phase? Uh, he, he was collecting cans, and the reason he was collecting cans was because, you know, he, he'd take, y'all understand, he'd, he'd take it and they would give him cash for the cans. And so way before they, they started bringing us those little blue buckets, Elder Hallie, the little blue bins, way before we went green, if I got ready to throw my soda can away, he was, ah, grandson, don't do that. H hand it here, hand it here. And he'd take the can and he'd put it in his bag. Run out to the truck sometimes and, and put it in his bag. Don't let us be driving down the street and he'd see too many cans assembled together. <laughs> like somebody had had a party and they just left everything. Don't make this little pit stop right here. Because he understood that even though everything that someone else thought was valuable on the inside of them had been taken away, that the can still had value. It just needed someone who had an eye to see it. A willingness to go pick it up. And to bring it to a place that had the val that saw it as valuable as he did. Y'all ain't feeling this, but some of us are too far removed from our salvation. 
So, some of us don't realize we were just like that soda cane. Yeah. If this was another Sunday and I had on the robe, then this would be a really good place for you to put me in D flat and we could go on and holler right there, right? You understand what I'm saying? Because there was this one time my life was as empty as a used soda can, but Jesus recycled. He, he said, don't throw him away. Don't throw him away. He's still valuable. I got there. There's something about him that can still be used. And don't worry because when I recycle him, he won't be what he is right now. Oh, Lord. But you don't lose value because you don't lose the father's love even when you lose his house. There, there's another movement that takes place and, 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 it's, and it's understanding that leaving the father's house means you don't leave ever his look. Here's what's interesting to me. The natural conclusion is that the father is always looking. The, the text says, the text says in verse 20, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. The natural assumption is every day he watches for him. The consistency is probably true and it is to be celebrated that he would stand in position, postured to receive his son. And I think you, that you and I like he ought to stay in a posture of expectancy and anticipation for the return. But I wanna present another side that could possibly be a little challenging. The father, the father is looking I believe because he knows why he left. Do, do you realize when y'all preachers, y'all have, if not already, you will preach this text, because it's a great text. It's just got a, a many, many, many messages are, are found in it, and, 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 and it's, it's always good. But you know the one thing for all of the sermons I've heard on this text that I have not heard argued is the fact that the Father doesn't stop him from leaving. There's no resistance. When you go back and you look at the text, verse 12, the son says to his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. I want to know what happened the day before. The son develops the gall to go ask his daddy, for what he's not supposed to get until he dies. What was the conversation that makes a son say, by the request, I wish you were dead? Because he's asking for what's not rightfully his until he dies. And so what fight might they have had? What was the ongoing disagreement that would cause a son to say, just let me have whatever you're going to give me, I'm leaving. And the father not fight it. We, we, we've never questioned the possibility that the father, either by his words or his actions, instigated the son's departure. That the reason the son leaves is because of friction with his father. Oh, y'all, that messed with your Sunday school stuff, don't it? All we focused on is the fact that he leaves and then goes, spins on and brings, finds himself in ruin. And then he develops the courage to come back home. Oh, when he came to himself, that's amazing. But maybe the reason he comes back home is because there is something inside of him that knows daddy still can't be mad. Well, I no longer want to be mad with my father. Maybe daddy is always looking because he's hoping for restoration, not just for the son to come home, but for the relationship. Here, here's what's amazing to me. There are moments that I, as a father, have operated negligently towards my children. I'm talking about I messed up. Moments they were right and I was wrong. I'll probably have to hear about that later. 
They bumping each other. Did you hear him? He said he was wrong. See, I know, I know exactly what time you're talking about. Too. <laughs> but in those moments, even when I was wrong, even, even when, when we walk away in the argument or, or, or the argument ends with us walking away, like, whatever, go to your room or whatever, daddy. It's, I don't even care no more. You know, you know kids, they, you know, they, that's where they go. <laughs> I had to get them back, you know what I'm saying? When there's no peaceful resolution, it does not change my heart towards them. When they go completely contrary to what I've taught them to do and what I hope for them to do, it does not change my heart towards them. And it doesn't stop me from looking. There, one, of the words, one of the words in the definition of jealous, the word jealous is watchful. So in part, to be jealous is to be watchful over. To be watchful over is to be jealous about. The father looks because there's a jealousy. Someone's got what belongs to me. And so I'm going to stand here every day waiting for it to come back home. Because the heart of a father never stops looking for his son. Maybe because, again, he knows why you left. I've got one last point, and it's going to take me one minute to say it. When the son comes home, Shirley, you know what blesses me? Is even though he's got this response or this, this, this prepared speech that he's going he's gonna to give to his dad, he rehearsed this thing, the whole walk from the pig pen to his daddy's house. He's rehearsed this thing. This is what I'm going to say as soon as I get there. I have sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. I am not worthy to be called your son. And he gets there. His daddy has seen him. He says his speech, and then his father says to the servants. See, y'all missed that. Because the son was prepared to be a servant. But when he showed up, the daddy talked to the servants. There was immediate distinction being made. You are not them. They are not you. So in case you forgot your value, y'all go get me a robe. Go get me a ring. That calf we've been getting ready, get it out the deep freezer. Y'all break, roast that thing, because we are getting ready to have a party. Here's why. Because my son was lost. He does not say he was a spendthrift. He does not say he was a mess. He does not say he is a drunkard and all he did was party and that he wasted my money. All he says is the same thing Jesus says. They were just lost. And when lost people come home, your focus is not on why they left. Thank you, Jesus. Your focus, your response is supposed to be celebration for the fact that they came back home. You don't need to ask them why they did what they did, how long they did what they did, why did they ever choose that thing? Like, you must have been out of your mind. That's none of your business. It doesn't even matter. If they come back home, you've got one responsibility. You celebrate the fact that that which was lost has now been found, but you can't have that celebration if you regard them as anything other than lost. And if you regard them as anything other than lost, you don't have a father's heart. You don't have the perspective that Jesus has about everybody who ain't you. They're just lost. That's all he says about them. Still talented, still valuable, still necessary, still important, just lost. Out of position. Out of the house, but not out of my heart. So I ask God, 
Brother Sims, why, why today? Why today? Why, 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 why this particular talk? Why this posture, God? It's a couple of things. First, he needed to make sure my perspective was right. Because right now, there are some getting their speech ready to come back home. They're getting their speech ready because there's an assumption of both your perception and their response, and your response to the fact that they'll come home. Right now, somebody's in the pig pen, determining, I'm gonna call sister so-and-so this week, because she always listens. I'm gonna call Deacon so-and-so because he was always smiling. And when they call, you gotta be willing to take what's given and move it to the next level. They may come because of your skill. Jesus was teaching, they often came for that. But you gotta be able to see them and move the relationship to a place of fellowship. Wait, he moves them to fellowship before they learn how to be different. He's in fellowship with them, and apparently by the verbiage of the text, they're still notorious sinners, but he's in fellowship. He's in fellowship with them. Certain ways I want to say certain things, but unfortunately the church ain't mature enough to have every conversation we need to have right now. And I don't mean the Citadel Church, I mean the body of Christ. You know what happens when that's the case? Sister Catherine, we respond like the other son did. Y'all know the story, so I can assume a lot. He gets mad because a party is being given for a son who was lost because all he could focus on was the fact that he left. All he could focus on was the fact that he wasn't as good as he supposed himself to be. Lord, help the church. And he doesn't come to the party because he's upset that his daddy would actually celebrate somebody who left. And that's where a lot of us are. We don't celebrate return because we're stuck on the fact that they left. And I hope y'all hear my heart today, really. That there is a reclamation of sons and daughters. Hear me. They're going to pop up on you. Some, some are going to just walk through the doors of church with a speech prepared. Because they, they have an assumption of how you're going to receive them. Here's the challenge. Just celebrate. Just rejoice. Just appreciate the fact that that which was lost is now found. Some are in the room right now. Some are watching virtually. And you've been in the pig pen all week. You have felt destitute. You have felt forsaken. And you've prepared yourself 
in a way to come home. Can I tell you this? The door is open. Our hearts are open. We don't care what you've been in. Doesn't even matter what you've had to fight through. We've got no questions except for two, maybe three. What size ring do you wear? What color robe do you want? And do you eat pork? That's all we want to know. Because we got a party. We want that. Lord, talking about coming back into relationship. And here's the thing. When you realize coming home is possible, you don't care who sees you, who knows what you used to be, what they think of you right now. You don't even care about it. You don't care about it. And so, symbolically, I'm just going to sit here, but I'm going to tell you, you can come home. If I'm talking to you, you're in this room, you want to return, this is your moment. No questions asked, just the party, just the party, just the party, because the Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. The Lord loves you. I didn't say you weren't saved. I said you were lost. And we got to get that, that, that shifted in our head. Not every lost person is unsaved. Not everyone out of the house is unsaved. Not every person in the house is saved. That's another conversation. I'm talking to people who know you're at a place of loss, regardless of how or why you left. It doesn't matter. If I'm talking to you, you come home. You come home. You come home. Come on. Lift that. Because he does love us. Oh. He loves us. Oh.
verse again in just a moment, but before you do, if you need a relationship with the Lord, you don't, you've never given your life to Christ, this is your moment, you can come. If you desire to make this church your home, you want to be in fellowship, you can come. You just need to touch a father. You can come. You can come. Because the Father's love is here for you. And it's available in rich measure. Here's why. You are. Come on. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. Love like a hurricane. Oh. I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so and oh He loves us. Stand to your feet, please. Oh. pray this week that you will seize upon that love. I do. I pray not only that you will seize upon that love, but I pray that you will not in any way hesitate to return to come back home. That's my prayer for you today. I believe decisions have to be made. I do. I believe changes have to be enacted. And I believe there's a grace that's associated with decisions made at the right time. So I'm saying, this is your week to return to the Father's love. It's there for you. It's there for you. It's there for you. Thank you so much to every person serving, working in ministry. Thank you. Thank you to those who knew it might be warm. Some saw the email, the notification. Some did not. Particularly worshiping in the sanctuary today. Pray that the part comes in on Tuesday like it's supposed to. Hallelujah. And we'll come on next Sunday. We'll just celebrate. Cool. Amen. Amen. Y'all celebrate your fathers well. Celebrate them well. Celebrate them well. Celebrate them well. Celebrate them well. The Lord bless you. It's your anniversary, ain't it? Today? Happy anniversary to you. How many years? 18 years. Praise the Lord. Juneteenth, Father's Day, anniversary. All on one day. It's a good day. 
You shouldn't do nothing. Nothing you don't want to do. Not today. Not today. Hallelujah. Not tomorrow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Happy anniversary. God bless you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Each and every one of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless your family. I love you.